Day 3. John O'Groats to Edinburgh. OK, yes, it's my fault we left at 9.50, but it was that damn Joe Famabag. I oh, said I wasn't going to say anything about it. I, I was now cloffy, and this bag was my leads. I just couldn't get it on right, and it just kept shifting about. Oh yes, and I'd bought too many things. However, a few minutes later, at 10 o'clock, we were at the sign. It was a great feeling, and I think I preferred the John O'Groat sign to the Lanzaned one. Perhaps I had to go take the bike right next to the sign, and I did like the calmer atmosphere and the more rural fishing fishing village feel but now we had to make our way back home and it wasn't going to be any easier than getting up the weather reports were all over the place so after a stop down the road I had to get my waterproofs on and to be honest it was a good call but also important stop because I had in my mind to go to Dunnett's Head the most northern tip of the country I did get the feeling that as we hobbled down a well-worn path the trans up hopped over the path holes and puddles, but it was a slow road down for the Deville. Um, as I imagine poorly muttering some choice words for my route selection. After another narrow miss with the postal van, while I was heroically, I mean, I did not make a miscalculation, I almost put myself in hedge again, but poorly was not looking too happy about any of this. It was an empty, yet quite wet and muddy car park. I did think it would be nice to have a few hours to sit and stare over the northern tip of the country and just watch the waves and think of all the history this spot had and this area had been witness to for the last 2,000 years. How many people had come to both see Lizard and this spot and had really been able to appreciate what an awe-inspiring and stunning place this plucky little island truly is. It was fascinating to go read all about the wildlife in the local area and how it supports different migration patterns. Ready to go then, Pooley said. I'd done it again. I'd got too busy reading signs and wandering off my own little world. I would be wandering in the dark and if I didn't get a wiggle on. We jumped back on and made our way back to the main road. With the excitement that it was all time to fill up, we stopped at Castletown petrol station. Uh, the more important point, beside the brilliant hot chocolate, they sold E95 as well as E99. We just really like the feel of the place, with heavy agricultural influence. But with a bonus of a kid's playground right in front of me. Oh, I wish I'd been brave enough to go play on the swings for a little while. We were late again. Most of the trip so far had been grey and wet. The first two days had been testing at best. My expectations for today Looking at the grey sky were not any better. It remained great and foreboding until way past Inverness. I think we stopped again at the same petrol station for the lulls. And a few minutes of reprieve from the wind and cold was always welcome. As well as another meal deal, of course. Every time I read or heard the names Helmsdale, I hear Helm's Deep. And the Lord of the Rings soundtrack starts in my head. Um, I'd a few weeks earlier got back from completing the NC500. We'd spoken quite a lot about his trip and I mentioned a lot about the places, but uh, Helm's Deep, I mean Helmsdale, cafe for some reason stuck with me. One you know about, and the second, um, somebody had said, it might be Andy, that they did a huge fish and chips there and it was brilliant, and the cafe by the river was stunning. After a detour to finally find the Time Span Cafe, I was really feeling the cold. But the cafe was closed due to staff shortages. The chippy was really expensive and an apple they were selling I think it was a quid. The saving grace was the museum which was next door. I was, we were able to use the facilities and I've got I've completed the NC500 tea towel. Yes and it was a bit premature. and But we also got a key ring so at least I'd had my trinkets. We jumped back on and kept going. I spotted the signs for a restaurant in the Cairngorms. My hands were still shaking, my back and legs were at this point at the point of revolt and I could have devoured three meal deals. But it was a nice place with a children's party in the adjoining section. They had loads of things in the little shop. I think Paul even bought a little teddy bear here. Paul was also chatting at the waitress but the view over the bridge and the stream below was very majestic.
At this point, we near the taste of Perth service station again, and it was a godsend. Pooley was ready for a fag break, and I needed something hot to eat. I had this amazing vegetable soup with the local bread. I think it was actually one of the best meals I've had in a very long time. I came in a shivering wreck, berating myself for carrying on with this trip. And after almost an hour, I'd been renewed and I was ready to get back out there on the road. Just over two hours later, we'd be at the hotel and it'd be the end of the day. The sense of achievement was real. I passed my test just a few days ago, got on a bike, and now I was back in Edinburgh, way back to Derbyshire. The weather had been genuinely challenging, and for a new rider who'd not ridden in those conditions, environment, and that length of time, on a brand new untested bike, and that had been a real adventure for me. But the realisation on day three was that I can do this. The confidence and self-belief I now had was earned and not imagined. It was from what I'd done today, not things I'd done 20 years ago. We celebrated our nice with a very nice bottle of whiskey. It had been a tradition for me to do this towards the end of every trip I'd taken in the past, where I'd been rationing the good stuff with a penultimate night, whilst we sat outside in the cold for what felt like absolutely ages, drinking, laughing and talking and going over what happened in the last few days. All the difficulties and aches were forgotten, and for a moment, everything was perfect. It remains one of my highlights from the trips, all with a wee dram and a Churchill in hand. End of day three. Edinburgh to Derbyshire. The next day, everything was now routine. It turned out the B&B owner was a biker, so we started by checking out his bikes. And after me gassing for an hour, we were late again. Whoops. It was a really wet day, with almost the entire day getting soaked. The difference today, I found, was actually my attitude and confidence. I had had no major leaps in my clothing during the trip. I now had more confidence in the transat, despite my Torvalindine action. And it was my last day travelling, because I was going to be home in a few hours. My money had not run out, even though it cost a lot more than I budgeted for. And the celebration last night had been the positivity and the psychological push that I needed to keep going for a few more days. And it was only one more day of riding left. Most of the trip was straightforward. We stopped a few times, had a few meal deals on the way. We stopped at Leeds at a Turkish restaurant I'd seen on the restaurant review channel. And it looked quite interesting, so I nudged to stop there for tea. However, some cheeky little tow rags, I decided to jump on our bikes and cause trouble. After a stern telling off, they vanished quickly, leaving us to enjoy an excellent meal. It was the same as yesterday. A warm meal while soaked and getting some heat in your body again made us ready for the last part of the trip. We soon found ourselves parked on the M1, just before Sheffield. I was laughing and almost in tears as I stretched my legs on lane one whilst Pooley chatted up a girl in a car. I think she was saying something about going to a concert from the little I heard, but it was a very bizarre and funny situation. It still makes me chuckle. We reached Derbyshire and the Alfreton BP later that night, in the dark and still raining. We congratulated each other and made a small video. And then I was alone again. It was strange not to have Pauli in my rear mirror anymore. After all, he had been a constant for the last four days. And the last half an hour or so back home felt lonely. But I focused on how much I'd miss my family. The joy that I would feel with the kids running into my arms and having the hero's welcome. I would have my return. I parked up and ran into the house. Oh my God, I've just cleaned the floor and you ruined it, said the wife. She deflated me in a second. She kept on going. The kids didn't even look at me. No one was bothered I'd been back and what a feat, from, well, from my view at the time, I'd achieved. 
it had just been like I'd been out to see a friend as walking back in. I was soon given a load of jobs and life brutally started again. As travellers, we really do live in a little bubble, yet we all must return home. I've lived this constantly through my travelling life. I suppose the point I'm trying to make is that adventurous trips or perhaps all journeys impact us in a multitude of ways. This was my second tour after Land's End, but my first pushing home that biking is not something that I'll ever be able to share with my family. Yet, making this day a relief at a time that perhaps one day, when my children or provider family would be in the same place, we would be able to share this trip. This trip was made possible due to the care and attention of my dear friend Paulie 650 and with the encouragement of to rider. I'm 100% sure that most people would have left me to carry on at their own pace, but Paulie stuck it out and didn't complain of my slow pace and my constant stops. This video is for those who support us. You're the real star. Thank you for watching. Take care, ride safe and stay curious.